So Japan had the seniority promotion system where you basically just get raises your whole life, but this meant they had to fire you at age 55 or 60 because like you got too expensive and like you're getting old. So they, they, they laid off all these guys like you're into early retirement. And these guys are sitting around with nothing to do. They've just been used to working their whole life. And they're like, what am I going to do? And the Korean government and Korean big companies like, you know, Samsung and, and, and Hyundai say, hey, guys, some teach us how to do that. Korea coming online really hurt Japan in terms of trade diversion, but even more than Korea. Korea was just a warm up for the real thing, which was China. So, so there have been efforts to reduce unproductive overtime, but the main thing they need is to encourage remote work, which I don't mean fully remote work. I mean, hybrid work. Women now work in Japan. So the idea of like women don't work is over. Women are more likely to have a job in Japan than in America, even at the height of our best job boom ever. Yeah. One guy was like, Hey man, where do I, where do I meet girls in this country? I was like, lunch. <laughs> you know you're the only man it's no no competition but that's gone i mean that's that's gone like but but the reason was because the men were just working 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 and they were expected to eat like lunch boxes at their at their open plan office desks well the women would just go out and eat lunch you know that was fine that those days are done Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. I excited to uh, excited to do a deep dive on Japan. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So, first, what got you so excited about Japan? I know you have a long uh, long history here. Uh, when you traced uh, your your journey on how how you fell in love with Japan. Wait, you mean like back in the day, like how I how I came yeah, to yeah. like the country of Japan itself? Yes. Oh, well, um, so it was the usual way that people fall in love with Japan is from anime or manga or video games, you know, sort of Japanese pop culture products. Um, but for me, I actually saw this movie called Battle Royale, which is what the Hunger Games is ripped off of Battle Royale, although Suzanne Collins will insist all the time she'd never heard of Battle Royale when she wrote the Hunger Games. It's an obvious lie. She ripped it off. Um, <laughs> and so Battle Royale is where, they, you know, this movie where they put kids on an island, uh, you know, a, a class of like high school freshmen basically put them on an island and have them uh, give them weapons and have them all kill each other off. Uh, similar to Hunger Games, except not a um, not necessarily a game show. But I was really, you know, it was supposed to be this ultra violent movie. Right. And I was very struck by how nonviolent that people wanted to be, you know, like no, nobody in almost nobody in the none of the kids actually wanted to kill anybody else. They weren't like, yeah, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. You know, like there were like two of those. Two. But, um, and then there was one uh, psychopath that they, they had to, they had to recruit a psychopath um, to, to run around killing people for fun. It was like it wasn't, uh, there was no psychopath among the, the high school freshmen. I thought this is so different than America. You know, in America, people would think like, yeah, I'm going to win. I'm going to be the winner. I'm going to kill. And then, um, and sure enough, in the Hunger Games, like, you know, people are pretty, they take the games as a game. You know, people tell them to play this game and they play this game and they try to win. And, you know, in, in, um, in Battle Royale, people are killing themselves to just to refuse to kill their friends. You know, they're just jumping off cliffs, hanging themselves, whatever. And so I was like, wow, that's, that's really different than just like, yeah, life is a game, play to win. So I, then I was like, okay, Japanese culture is interesting. I should learn more about it. So I took a Japanese class, um, like an intensive Japanese class my senior year of college. And then uh, my Japanese teacher suggested that I take a, uh, a trip to Japan over spring break, that year, which I did. Um, and it was just, I was like, wow, this is like a different universe. This is so cool. And uh, that's amazing. I first got into my head the idea that I would sometime move to Japan. And then, um, then I discovered the Japanese street fashion scene uh, through a friend of mine, you know, uh, who showed me the book Fruits, which is a picture book of street fashion from the 90s in Japan. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing this is so good um you know i've got to go there and so then i decided to go live in japan so i went and i lived in japan for about three years after college and i um you know i continued to study japanese on my own and get better and then i um lived there for one more year during grad school to do some research so basically i lived there for about four years total and then i go back you know frequently i go back every year at least once um and then, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much the whole story. And as for the Japanese economy, it, you know, most of my understanding just comes from reading things and talking to people that I know. I didn't do any research about the Japanese economy. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. 
Yeah, but before getting into the the economy and sort of the the, the, the politics. Let's let's spend another minute on culture. What makes Japanese culture so compelling, uh, you know, sort of globally, or, or sort of, you know, in some ways, it's like, uh, you know, one of the cultural superpowers. And what, what you had a broader poster at some point, or what makes a cultural superpower? So let, let's get into that a little bit, because usually people just think about the power of American culture being exported g- globally, and they don't give enough credit to maybe other countries' right. ability to export culture as well. I think the thing that makes people uh, like it the most is that um, Japanese culture is mo- is gentler uh, than than a lot of other cultures. Not than not all other cultures, but it's just an extremely gentle culture. And sometimes, you know, the, in cartoons, this manifests as like you know the the shy guy gets the girl, you know, <laughs> um, or not even gets the girl, but like you know, in America, we have the the arc of like the the shy guy gets the girl, like Spider Man, right? He's the yeah. shy guy. But but basically, you have to become a badass. You got to like you know <laughs> hit the gym, work out, become this this badass. And in Japan, the shy guy is already attractive to the girls because the girls just kind of like him, even though he doesn't realize it, and he's too shy to take advantage, of it. right? And so like the, these girls are like, mm, this guy's cute, yeah. and then he's just like he's just like, but I'm shy, and they're like, mm. and then like the girls are like hitting on the guy, and and um and and so that's like I think people like this idea that you can be shy. But yeah. still be like a romantic person, you know, yeah. and that's just one thing. Um, there's, you know, like there's a there's Japan's an extremely artistic country, so there's uh, like a lot of people just do art for fun. Um, that's one reason manga became so popular. Um, manga was people treating comics as a sort of a form of art, you know, instead of just a wham bang pow kind of stuff. Uh, you know, even the the positions of the letters on the page were thought to be like you know sort of an artistic thing, and it was. Um, and I think that craftsmanship and that quality uh, was recognized. Also, that Japan didn't have the comic code, which America had, which prevented adult themes in um, in comics for many, many decades, and was abandoned in the nineties. And so, um, so those you know those things uh, combined. Um, but then you know, also Japan has really great urbanism. Like people love Japanese cities. Yeah. Uh, have you been to Japan? Remind me. No, but I'm going to go this year. I've, I've resolved uh, to, to, to. Are you going to go? Are we yeah, going to yeah. go together? I, I would love that. Yeah. All right. I'll am I going to show you around? Yeah. That'd All right. Be, that'd be amazing. I've never, I, I've I mean, told, I've I done hear, it. Yeah. I hear amazing I things. I mean, like so. several of our friends, as you know, yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've done the same I wanted trip to go on so. the last one, but uh, hopefully I'll go uh, although this year on this one. Yeah. Well, let's go. Yeah. Then I just lived in Japan, made a bunch of friends there. I got, I got really into like Japanese, you know, underground culture. Like most people get into the pop culture stuff, but I was more, I was like, I would go see a ton of like, you know, basement rock shows and like, um, you know, hang around and take pictures of street fashion kids. And that was my, that was pretty my, much my jam or, or like watch, you know, indie movies. Um, uh, yeah, like the, there were some directors that I really liked, like uh, Miike Takashi or Iwai Shinji or Nakashima Tetsuya. Yeah. So the, there were just, you know, there was a lot of cool underground culture in Japan that I really liked. So, you know, that, um, that sort of added to it. And, yeah, yeah. You have a great blog post uh, dissecting the weeb um, and what, uh, yeah, what, what what attracts them. I highly recommend people read it. We'll, we'll uh, link it in the in the show notes. Noah, pretend I was around in 1918, but then I went into a coma for a hundred years. What happened to Japan? So, if you're in 1918, Japan was a rapidly industrializing country, and they had um, they had defeated Russia in a war. So people sort of you know, in those days, people didn't think about GDP and economic statistics as much. They really thought uh, very much about prowess on the battlefield because countries fought a lot. And World War One was sort of the first war where countries realized, like, oh my God, we can't just keep fighting to determine like who's best and how well our countries are doing because the fighting is very destructive and we're destroying ourselves. But um, so in 1918, they were just starting to realize this uh, this truth, um, which some people had anticipated. You know, uh, um, Norman Angel had anticipated this. So. Uh, anyway, so Japan mostly stayed out of this war and just came in on the Allied side and like grabbed a couple German colonies and you know uh, things like that because Japan wanted this colonial empire. Japan technologically and industrially was still behind the West. Uh, you know, the top manufacturing nations in the world were still uh, Germany, the United States, and uh, actually Britain still at that time. You know, those were the, those were the best manufacturers in the world. Japan was like way behind. They were like in the category of like Russia or you know maybe even Italy or something like that, you know, behind France, they were definitely an also ran at the time. 
People also thought of them as a very traditional culture. You know, um, later on, we like like people didn't really conflate Japan and China. Actually, they they respected Japan a lot more than they respected China because China had been sort of chaotic and falling apart for a little while at that point. But um, but they thought of Japan as this warrior nation. You know, they didn't necessarily think of them as a manufacturing champ the way we did in like the eighties, right? We, they 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 thought of them as like this this nation of samurai, this nation of of you know warriors. And so uh, you know, and the Russian war victory reinforced that. Now, uh, you know, if you fast forward to now, Japan um, became known as a manufacturing champ and now is sort of losing that reputation as its manufacturing industries have, you know, sort of lost out to competition. So it's, it's losing its, its sheen as like this champ of manufacturing, but it had it for many decades in the post-war. Um, and now Japan has a reputation for being very peaceful because in the post-war period, they were very pacifist and they're losing that reputation again now as they rearm uh, to defend against possible Chinese attack. So the perceptions of Japan have changed as Japan has changed. The, you know, no matter where Japan is, we always tell this, this, you know, Japan is so interesting and different that we always tell each other this lie that it's always been this way. And that Japan is just this, you know, pure, essential, unchanging sort of, you know, Mount Fuji, cherry blossoms, uh, you know, sort of ancient thing that just never changes. And of course, Japanese people tell themselves this story too, because it's comforting, you know, like change is scary. Um, the fact is that Japan changes a lot. So Japan went from, you know, a sort of like isolated feudal state to kind of a, you know, a, a very modernist, um, you know, sort of militarist state modeled on some combination of Prussia and the UK. Um, and then, um, you know, changed into this, you know, peaceful yet, uh, you know, highly industrialized state in the post-war period. And now it's, sort of, it's changing again. And so Japan undergoes these big changes and cultural changes come with these changes. The idea that Japanese culture never changes is just wrong. It's so different that it's easy to imagine that, um, that it's just the same as it's always been. But it's not. Like in the time I've been going there, there have been huge cultural changes. In Japan. Yeah. And at, at one point, we were scared that Japan was going to compete with the U.S., right? That they were going to become, become competitive. What, what happened? Well, um, those fears were always very, very misplaced. The United States was not yet used to the idea that we're not the make everything country anymore. We had been sort of the center of world manufacturing and we made everything and we had the industrial might at the end of World War II. We, at the end of World War II, we were really where China is now in terms of manufacturing or even more, you know, in terms of, uh, and, and losing that exclusivity of manufacturing was very much anxiety inducing for a country that had prided itself on that for, you know, over half a century. So I think that, but, but the, 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 and the how, how did they lose the manufacturing? Well, it's not, I mean, like we didn't really lose it, uh, to Japan or, or Germany or France or any of these other countries we were worried about. What happened is they recovered, they got, they got good at stuff, but that actually didn't come at our expense. So you saw American manufacturing continue to climb during those times. We just started to specialize. In so there were some things that, that we used to make that now Japan made and our specific industry would lose out but then we would come up with different industries and we'd lead in those industries and some industries japan tried to compete with us and just absolutely failed right like um japan tried to compete with us in semiconductors and just failed japan tried to compete with us in um like um motorcycles and actually kind of failed um and there there were just a number of, of things where japan failed to, to compete and there's this book called can japan compete written around the the turn of the century that sort of looks back and looks at where Japan succeeded and where they failed in terms of competing with the United States in manufacturing. But this is the normal process of specialization. You know, countries uh, get good at one thing and they're better at one thing, they're not good at another thing, and they specialize, right? So like, you know, maybe Japan is better at making little compact cars that, you know, never break and don't use much fuel, right? For like the 70s uh, when we had expensive oil. Right. That was great. And so that was maybe we weren't good at that, but maybe we were great at making like SUVs, which Japanese companies couldn't really compete against uh, because, you know, or big trucks. You know, Japanese companies had no idea of the like Ford tough mythos like Toyota tried to compete and they, they sold a few trucks. But like ultimately Ford, uh, you know, sort of and but yeah, just, just won that competition. So like nations specialize. Right. Even at the micro level of just like cars versus trucks, those aren't that different a product, but they they specialize in terms of marketing and branding and blah, blah, blah. And they also specialize in terms of technology because uh, technology, technological capabilities are contained within specific companies that sort of hoard those abilities or not, if not even hoard them, it's just contained within the tacit knowledge of the people who work there. And so Japan was never really it was a competitive threat to specific industries, 
So like, you know, a lot of the ele consumer electronics companies of America just got completely outcompeted because consumer electronics is just so, honestly, it's so like labor intensive um, that, you know, Japan didn't really have cheap labor either. <laughs> um, but then, and so Japan lost those industries as well. We, we were good at some things. We weren't good at other things, but we had been the country that was good at everything. We had been the country that never lost uh, on, in any market, right? In the end of World War II, because everyone else had been destroyed and, you know, we were just used to making everything. Even once Japan and Germany and France, uh, you know, Britain never really came back. But then once Japan and Germany and to a lesser extent France uh, came back and South Korea started coming up and Taiwan started coming up as well, um, we became more specialized. And our manufacturing continued to go up. In fact, it continued to go up and right up until China entered the scene. Um, and that was qualitatively different than what we'd seen from Japan. The competition that we faced from China ultimately was, was much, much different. The competition we faced from Japan was one of specialization. They would win some industries. We would win some industries. We weren't used to that. That was terrifying for us at the time, even though it shouldn't have been. And a lot of economists were out there saying, no, no, it's fine. You know, this is not scary. American manufacturing is still growing blah, blah. And, um, you know, output is still growing, even if employment wasn't growing as much because of automation, you know, it was getting more automated. That was true in Japan. Um, you know, most people you meet in Japan aren't working in a factory. Most people you meet in South Korea aren't working in Japan, um, because it's pretty automated. But then economists were saying, don't worry, don't worry. This is not a big deal. Right. And it wasn't a big deal. Um, Germany or Japan either. Um, it, it turned out not to be a big deal. And then, um, you know, it was, it was bad for some industries, good for other industries. We traded a lot with Japan. Japan actually bought a lot of American stuff. Um, then, then what happened is that Japanese car companies, after winning the, you know, sedan market, started making all their sedans in America because they realized that shipping massive numbers of sedans across the ocean doesn't really make a lot of sense. And that actually you can train people in Kentucky to not make any errors as well with Japanese management methods. Um, you know, a, a sedan made in Kentucky will actually, it will have a, like more errors than than one made in Japan, but the difference management methods are so good that the difference in those error rates is like minuscule, you know. And it's and the error rates are extremely low. So now you have these incredibly well made Toyota, Honda, and Nissan cars. They're all made in Kentucky and Alabama and Tennessee, and you know, like uh, and those 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 three states like are, are really big for Japanese car manufacturing. They're made in America. The a Toyota is more made in America than a Ford, right? A Nissan is more made in America than a GM car. Like J Japanese cars are actually now the most made in America because Japanese management methods, well, first of all, because they went to the non-union states, so they got slightly cheaper labor there, but also just because their management methods were so good that even, you know, us dumbass, uneducated American hicks can still learn to make zero error cars the Japanese way. And it's not actually that hard. All it requires is like, you know, like, Constant cross-checking and cooperation. That's that was the the thing. It's like you just constantly cross-check what the other person does. That was the se great secret of Japanese manufacturing. Was like I check your work, you check my work. That's it. Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know: thirty-six thousand, twenty-five, and one. Thirty-six thousand. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash 102. netsuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash 102. But did you mention Japanese manufacturing was stalling a little bit? Oh yeah, Japanese manufacturing's been stalling for a while. So, so Why Japanese that? Japanese manufacturing. So, there's a number of reasons. Um, one is that Japanese costs are really high compared to other places. But so, remember how I talked about specialization, right? Like, um, so you know, Japan turned out to be good at making consumer electronics, but we were good at making you know high-end semiconductors like microchips and stuff. 
Now, then what happened to Japan is that the same things they were good at making, Korea was very good at making. And what that meant was that Korea, when Korea came online, um, you know, of course, Japan and Korea can trade, but Korea was so similar to Japan, also because all the people who built Korean manufacturing hired a shit ton of Japanese people to teach them how to do all the Japanese stuff, which they then did. So Japan had the seniority promotion system where you basically just get raises your whole life, but this meant they had to fire you at age 55 or 60 because like you got too expensive and like you're getting old. So they, they, they laid off all these guys like into early retirement. And these guys are sitting around with nothing to do. They've just been used to working their whole life. And they're like, what am I going to do? And the Korean government and Korean big companies like, you know, Samsung and, and, and Hyundai say, hey, guys, come teach us how to do that. You know, we'll pay you, you know, triple what you're making in Japan or whatever. If you just teach all our guys and then you can just like live this nice life in Korea and, and you know, chill. And these, these guys are like, well, in that case. And so they would all go over to Korea and, and, you know, the Korean guys hired all the old Japanese guys. They taught them how to do all their stuff. And then, and then Korea appropriated all of Japan's technology that way, just to human transfer. And so then the Korean companies come along. Samsung does all the stuff that Panasonic and Sony do, right? And, um, and Hyundai does, you know, Hyundai actually failed to outcompete um, Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. Toyota, Honda, and Nissan still beat Hyundai. But, but Samsung and LG outcompeted Sony and Panasonic. And all the other Japanese companies like Sharp and, you know, whatever, like all the electronic companies, they just got outcompeted by their Korean rivals. Korea had lower labor costs at first, but that wasn't, that turned out not to be as big a deal. Um, uh, Korea was quicker to offshore production to Vietnam. They, um, Korea's corporate culture was better and more flexible. It's not good. Like, I won't say Korean corporate culture is good, but it is less bad than Japanese corporate culture. And so, Japan was getting very top heavy. Japanese management ranks were getting very top heavy with all these old guys who, because of the seniority promotion and, you know, system, were, you know, Japan and, and, and population aging. Japan was chock full of old guys and they ran all the companies. And so you got these old managers of Panasonic and Sony who have no idea how to like adapt to the ever changing market and new business practices and new markets and new technologies and blah, 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 and new management, whatever. Right, they can't adapt. They're old. They're, they're because of seniority. All the you know, all the top positions, all the management positions are filled with old. And so then, and Korea was still younger at that time. Korea is now getting older than Japan because it, it, its fertility crashed to well below Japanese levels. But that's a story for another day. Um, Korea was younger than Japan, and it also had it had seniority promotion, but had less. And they they allowed you know younger people to have a more of a role. When I say younger people, I mean people in their like thirties, right, forties. As opposed to like guys in their sixties, right? Um, Korea is also very sexist, like Japan, so that sucked. Um, so they underutilized women, but they um, their management culture was just less crappy than Japan's. And for this reason, a lot of you know some of their companies managed to outcompete Japanese companies because they're more flexible. Korea was also more willing to outsource stuff to China because of Japan and China's bad relations. That helped. Korea sort of started taking away a lot of industries from Japan because the stuff Korea did internationally in the international trading system was so similar to Japan that it resulted in something that economists call trade diversion. So remember uh, back from Econ 101, um, before 102, remember the, the <laughs> idea of uh, like comparative advantage and all that stuff? Yes. Like, yeah, suppose that like, you know, I'm good at making blogs and, you know, you're good at making... Um, Remember podcast. what the company does again? Podcast, yes. <laughs> of course. You're going to make podcasts, so we can trade blogs for podcasts. But then along comes someone else who's as you know better than me at blogging, um, you know. And then uh, I, you know, the specialization system is still working. It's just not. I, I lose out, right? My niche is competed away, and I'm still gaining from trade overall. I'm just gaining less than I was before, so it, it stalls me out. So this is called trade diversion. And Korea coming online really hurt Japan in terms of trade diversion, but even more than Korea. Korea was just a warm up for the real thing, which was China. So then China comes on, and then China subsidizes all its costs. So, like, Korea is not really subsidizing costs that much. You know, they have some industrial policy stuff, but China is like, hey, free land. We just kick these peasants off, right? And we're giving you free land so we can give a kickback to the local government official because that's how their system works. And the government owned all the land because of communism. And so they're like, hey, free land. Hey, free coal. You can just burn as much coal as you want. We have infinite coal. We don't care about climate change. And then, um, you know, how about free, uh, you know, free capital? We'll just, we'll just throw cheap loans at you. 
Yeah, and stuff like that. Oh, union getting you down? Union leader in prison for anti-communist activities. Or, you know, like, so So China subsidizes absolutely everything, right? Including super low tax. Um, and Japan couldn't compete with that. And so because Japan had all these old guys in, in sort of positions of power within management, they couldn't adapt either. So Americans, you know, our, our older companies had trouble adapting. Like, where's, where's like Kodak now, right? Where's like JVC? Or, oh, no, that JVC is Japan, Japanese. What's our, what's our one? Uh, RCA. Uh, no, so JVC is Japanese company. They, they also died uh, pretty much. And so, like, you know, our companies, some of them didn't compete. But some really did compete, right? So, like, Apple. Right. Apple's like, OK, we're going to do the manufacturing in China and we're just going to design this stuff. And that was they specialized. Right. They had um, young, hungry people or in the case of Steve Jobs, old, hungry people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like, He stayed hungry and uh, possibly stayed foolish. But, um, <laughs> and then his then his inventions destroyed the entire social life of Gen Z. But anyway, <laughs> neither here nor there, <laughs> neither here nor there. We, we should do like a like a Gen Z, like yeah. the Gen Z sucks. <laughs> um, because they've been destroyed by phones, generation destroyed by phones. Yes. So um, Japan uh, then um, could, was not flexible. It couldn't adapt like American companies could adapt. And, it, and also, startups were not common because venture financing was only very early stage. You could get a check for like 10K. You, know, you couldn't get a check for like, you know, 20 million you know, or a hundred million or something like that. You couldn't, you couldn't raise that kind of money as a, as a up and coming com um, company. Um, export promotion fell off because after sort of some of the competitive failures of the nineties and two thousands, Japanese companies, uh, Japanese, the Japanese bureaucracy decided industrial policy was bad and they weren't going to really do it anymore. So then export subsidies sort of fell off, whereas Korea continued uh, some of theirs and uh, China just pumped it way up and, you know, starting in like the late two thousands or really 20s, China pumped it way up. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so um, really, Japan lost its sort of uh, place in the electronics supply chain. Japan, Japanese car companies are still good. Now, now Japanese car companies are losing out because they're missing the switch to electric. But that is also true of everyone who's not China. Um, we, can, we can talk about the car wars. That, would be, that might be a good episode, the, um, the car wars. Yeah. I, wrote a, a little, I wrote a post about that a little while ago, but it's, it's a big deal now. I'll write another post about that soon about like people trying to protect yeah. their car market. And then, and then let's do a deep dive on it. But, but yeah. zooming out, basically what we're talking about is there's, there's some truth to the idea that J Japan sort of in some key ways missed its potential or didn't live up to its potential uh, economically or in terms of productivity. And you're explaining reasons why there's a bit of a slowdown. Is that, is that right? That's right. And it's why J Japan lost its, its reputation as this manufacturing powerhouse. Um, high costs, but more importantly, old guys in charge. And China, you know, China came in. Yeah. And so you have, you wrote a post about some ideas to boost J Japanese growth because you know, Japanese living standards, you also have a post of why they're too low. So why don't you unpack uh, the, 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 these ideas? Right. So management culture needs to change and Japan needs to promote young people and, you know, encourage high growth startups. So encourage startups to go from, from you know, like medium to big. Encourage you to go from like a five hundred million dollar valuation to like a five billion dollar valuation, like growth financing, growth PE. Like Japan needs a lot of private equity. That's weird because Americans are so used to hating on private equity, not without cause. That um, you know, we're so used to these like we're used to hating on private equity, right? Because we're used to all these um sort of uh, LBO firms just asset stripping, loading companies up with debt and all that stuff we don't like. But we forget that private equity actually has a very important role in terms of providing large amounts of late stage financing. And in terms of improving operations, blah, 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 in other countries, like where the tax incentives are such that that's more what private equity does. You know, um, in America, the tax incentives are very much for private equity to just load companies up with debt so they can transfer all the money as a special dividend to their, their investors. In Japan, that's not true. And in France, that's not true. And so private equity there can be a lot more productivity boosting. And so Japan needs growth PE to do that. They need to reform the corporate culture. And so Japan has actually taken strides to reform the corporate culture in a number of ways. Uh, most importantly, they have tried to shift to shareholder value creation from managers ruling everything. So they've, they've increased, they released a new, you know, corporate governance code and shareholder code and these things um, about a decade ago. And they've been updating them ever since. And 
the, the implementation of these has been pretty good. They got more outside directors for boards. Japanese companies have boosted profitability a lot. And so, so this is, it, it's belated, but it's actually working well. The one problem is that the, the management system isn't changing. Japan needs to switch to a management system where old people aren't automatically put in charge of a company, where young people are, can boss around old people. That still doesn't exist. And it's not because of like Confucian deference to age and blah, blah, blah. It is not a Confucian thing because it's, you know, like Korea is doing less of this, right? And Korea is renowned as much more Confucianist than Japan. That's uh, the Japanese stereotype of, of Korea is um, that they're very Confucianist. Reigi uh, tadashi would be the expression. It's uh, just, you know, they, they call it Confucian. It's not a necessarily an accurate stereotype. But the point is that it's, this isn't like some, you know, essentialized Asian blah, blah, blah. This is the structure of Japanese corporations. The structure of Japanese corporations is the hierarchies that the nation ran on. You know, in America, people have little loyalty to corporate organizations. And every time they think they have loyalty, like, this company's different. It's Google. They wouldn't fire me. Yes, they would. They would give me a ball pit. No more ball pit. They'd let, you know, they'd let me just work on whatever I want. No. <laughs> so, like, every time that, you know, America, Americans learn again and again this lesson that, like, corporations are just you know, contingent arrangements of like, you know, financing and, and like workflow, you know, they're not like these, these cradle to grave, you know, behemoths that can just protect you your whole life. And, and Japan is, is a lot harder to learn that lesson. They need to switch corporate governance such that old people aren't automatically put in charge of everything. And so that's a big deal. They need to, um, so, so there have been efforts to reduce unproductive overtime. But the main thing they need is to encourage remote work, which I don't mean fully remote work. I mean, hybrid work they need. So in America, people are pretty used to taking some of their work home with you, home with them, right? Like um, maybe you, there's some stuff you need to get done at the office where you need to talk to people. But then there's some stuff like, you know, I just have to put together this PowerPoint. I don't need to do that in the office. You know, I need to like just write this code on my own. I don't need to necessarily do that in the office. And so there's. This system that worked really well for manufacturing, where everybody cross-checks each other, doesn't work very well for office work. And so the problem is Japan tried to use the same system for office work. They tried to just translate the, the, the manufacturing system to office work in some way, where basically, if you look at a Japanese office, it's open plan. Everybody's just at these long desks. Everybody watches everyone else to make sure they're doing something. And because of that, uh, people just do busy work with useless busy work. Hours and hours and hours of useless busy work, which they're really just not doing it. Um, and they're costing all this money and they're just not doing anything because they have to be seen to be busy. If they had, you know, cubicles, it would be better. But more importantly, Japanese companies need to trust their employees to get some stuff done on their own. Now, manufacturing, that's a bad approach. You do not want someone who's on the assembly line going home and like making the part themselves without anyone checking them. That's bad, right? But with office work where you're, you know, filling out paperwork or you're writing code or you're like, you know, um, working on putting together some sales account or, you know, I don't know, whatever, like, um, or like a presentation or something. A lot of that can be done on your own and you do it more efficiently on your own with now anyone looking over your shoulder. And so Japan need Japanese management needs to learn this. They need to, to let people do more remote work. So less seniority promotion, let, uh, more remote work, less like cross-checking in the office. It are the two management innovations that Japan just really needs. Um, Japan also needs to become more internationalized, um, uh, you know, but they, they, they know that, right? So some of these are, are things they know. They know they need more late stage financing. They know they need to be more internationalized. They know they need more shareholder value. They know this stuff. What they, they're, they, they also know that they need to like stop the seniority promotion thing, but they're afraid to do it because it's the social contract, right? It's, the, it's like, that's what keeps society together is that like everyone knows because they, they don't have a real welfare state like Scandinavia. Everyone knows that like what's going to take care of you when you're old is that your company puts you in charge and gives you a nice high salary and pension. Entry level salaries in Japan are crap. And that's one reason they can't attract high skilled immigrants, right? You go, you're, you go to an entry level job as a high skilled, you know, so suppose you're like an engineer, you're a high skilled engineer. You go to Japan and some company will give you an entry level salary of, you know, like $80,000, right? Uh, and then you go to America and you get an entry level salary of like, $250,000, something like that. It's, it's like a factor of three. Years. And one reason is because Japanese companies reserve all their money for the old guys. Because you need all this, because you have seniority promotions and seniority pay. 
as you just as you live, as you continue to exist and not die, right? Assuming you don't do something egregious enough to get fired, or your company doesn't die and have to do layoffs, um, then you uh, you get older and older, and you get paid more and more. But that means they have to pay young people less, right? Because they have only a certain amount of budget to spend on labor. So you get paid much less as a young person. So it's it's not a very attractive thing. And so you know, young people don't want to are, are not very motivated either. So they need to reward youth more and age less. Uh, and that's going to be difficult for the social hierarchy and social model of Japan because people are used to these age hierarchies within companies. It's not confusionism. It's, it's just corporate culture. People are used to age hierarchies within companies. So that needs to end. And, um, and people are used to cross-checking each other at work, and that needs to end. People need to go home to do some of their work, which incidentally will also help them take care of kids. Yeah. Another thing you believe that they need to do is export more. And right. you also wrote about why they aren't you know, you also wrote about questioning what, why aren't they taking advantage of the weekend? Right. Uh, now they are. So they, the, this finally kicked in and they finally did realize that. So that post is a little over a year out of date. And in the year since, year and change since then, they have actually uh, done more. Um, because they, they, they knew this and they did something. Um, of course, they all read the No Opinion blog. Um, <laughs> some Japanese government people tell me they do read, read my blog. I'm sure. Um, so then, uh, yes, that's very important. So basically, the, what happened is that, remember how I was talking about this trade diversion, um, Korea, and then later China came in and did sort of similar stuff to Japan, but cheaper, mm -hmm. um, and just sort of cut Japan out of its traditional niche within the global trading system. That doesn't mean Japan needs to simply copy them and, and fight back and get this niche back and like, you know, have Sony and Panasonic outcompete, you know, whatever Chinese electronic companies again. That doesn't necessarily mean that. I mean, maybe, but like, I think much more important is Japan needs to find new niches in the global trading system, find new things that it works, that it's best at in the new system that we're getting today. And that new system does include some things like friendshoring that will be advantageous to Japan, right? America doesn't want to buy stuff from China anymore. We want to buy stuff from allied countries or at least friendly countries, right? We want to buy stuff from India, Vietnam, Mexico. Well, guess what? Japan's wages are pretty cheap now, right? Those, the high cost era is done. Like, um, there's, there's still high, like, you know, land costs or not as high as America, but, and, and still can be high energy costs, especially because they had the whole nuclear thing where they shut down the nuclear plants after the, the Fukushima thing. Um, that's another story. But Japan needs to find its place in the international uh, trading system. It needs to find new industries that work new niches. How do you find that? Well, you need startups, you need companies to like try new things, like I've been talking about, but you need exports. You need to promote exports because that helps companies search for what they're good at now. And Danny Roderick, an economist who's been, you know, suggesting export promotion is sort of the pillar of industrial policy for decades now, says basically the point of industrial policy is to find what you're good at. And so Japan lost what it was relatively good at. You know, it's still fine at making electronics, but it's it just can't compete with China's cost structure very easily um, and on the low end. And then at the high end, it lost a lot of its technological uh, edge to um, Korea and Taiwan, um, especially Korea. And so Japan, you know, maybe you can compete with those guys, but, but comparative advantage is going to be more important than competitive advantage. And to find your comparative advantage, to find where you fit in. Comparative, competitive advantage is like where you can undercut someone else. Comparative advantage is where you fit in, where you can complement someone else. Ultimately, trade is more about comparative advantage than competitive. Advantage. We naturally think of competitive advantage, like we need to get this industry back. You know, we all naturally think of that. We we don't tend to think of like how can I add value to the system. And Japan needs to find new ways of adding where it can add value to the system. And a lot of those things will be in manufacturing, and some will not. Some will be in services. A lot, but a lot will be in manufacturing. And so exports are the key because exports force you to go out there and compete in the global market. They force you to know what, you know, the, the, the pool of consumers of the world is just so much huger than the tiny and shrinking pool of consumers within Japan. So to, to learn more about that pool of consumers, you have to try selling them stuff and you have to have offices over there and you have to talk to those customers over there and observe what they consume and how they consume and see what they do and learn about it. You've got to go out. You know, you've got to go out to the world. And so that's what um, Japan needs to do. Export promotion is the way to do that. 
Japan lost some of its niches from its old, you know, 1980s economy. It needs to find, maybe it can get some of those niches back, but really it needs to find new niches and export promotion is just how you do that. Yeah. Let, let's segue from trade to, to immigration. T- talk about how immigration has evolved in Japan. You know, Japan gets, gets uh, sort of, you know, there are a lot of comments about its homogeneity and the sort of pros and cons that that, that, that brings. W- why don't you talk a bit about, about this and how you see it? Right. So Europe made a choice to, you know, European societies are very homogeneous in 1980. And European societies made a conscious choice to supplement their aging workforces by bringing in a bunch of immigrants. So Germany brought in a bunch of people from Turkey, which was like a friendly country, um, especially to work in like the auto industry and manufacturing, like a bunch of Turkish laborers came over. France brought brought a bunch of people from Algeria, which had been a former colony of France and had a very contentious history with France. Britain brought in a bunch of people from its former colonies, especially Pakistan, um, and then and a few places in Africa. Uh, but then, but you know, especially like in terms of mass immigration, like especially Pakistan and like central, central, uh, south, south. South. And so um, those countries made that decision. And then later, you know, uh, countries took a bunch of refugees from the wars in the Middle East. But, um, but that was much later. They, European countries made this conscious choice to take immigration, often from the Middle East to North Africa, uh, to supplement their aging populations. Japan decided, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, this is in the 80s, 90s, and uh, even 2000s. Japan said no to immigration. This is what everyone thinks about when they think about Japanese immigration, right? They think about this era of maybe 30 years when Europe, Europe encouraged immigration, Japan did not. Japan's like, you're going to have problems with that because they're not going to fit in. They're going to riot, blah, blah. I mean, they were right. You know, they <laughs> like Japan turned out to be right about that. But um, finally, the aging problem got so bad and companies had such trouble finding workers that Shinzo Abe came in uh, in the, you know, in 2012, 2013 and said, all right, immigration, we got to do this. Like we have no choice. So Shinzo Abe opened Japan up to immigration. And that's a thing that almost no one knows. People's conceptions of people have their conception of Japan that they want to think about. You know, like like right wingers often want to think Japan is this you know homogeneous paradise. There, there's something to that. You know, like homogeneity helped Japan in many ways. If you know, it obviously hurts because then if you have low fertility, you don't have any people, right? You um uh, so so homogeneity homogeneity hurt them in that way. But then um, homogeneity helped them in many ways. And so the the right wingers were right about that. The but people, but what people don't realize is that in 2013, Japan really changed, and they they opened themselves up to immigration. They created a guest worker program that actually has a path to permanent residency and citizenship. So it's not really a guest worker program; it's really just more like our uh, um, H-1A visa. Uh, so you actually can stay if you really want to. Um, they created uh, a high skilled immigration like fast track. So if you want to go live in Japan, you can do that very easily as can I. And then they also uh, created a lot more, uh, they, they liberalized the rules to allow foreign students to work um, and made it easier for companies to hire people from overseas uh, for what you know we would call green cards. And so they, did, they liberalized these rules and you saw a big increase in the number of people coming to Japan. Now, people who, who hold on to this idea of Japan as, a, as this anti-immigrant place for whatever reason, they say, okay, well, but it's only like, you know, it's only like three or four, it's only like 4% of Japan's population or something like that, right? That's so small compared to these other countries. Yeah, but that's up from like 0.1%. Come on. Also, those statistics, Japan does not take statistics on people's race or ethnicity. They just do not collect those statistics. Uh, France also, by the way. Um, so you don't actually know. So, so the statistics you hear about how many people are like foreign in Japan those are people who were born in a foreign country. If you have someone of Russian descent or of Filipino descent or of Chinese descent who was born in Japan, they are simply counted as Japanese in the statistics. That is a Japanese person in the statistics. And they all, of course, you know, speak Japanese and go to Japanese schools and, you know, sort of like are, uh, you know, I don't know, watch the same cartoons. They're, they're, you know, assimilation in Japan works pretty well, actually. Um, but uh, but um, they're count- those people are counted as minorities who were born in Japan are counted as Japanese in Japanese government statistics. And that's what people don't seem to realize. 
Um, so people are dumb. So people don't understand the extent of immigration and diversity in Japan these days for two reasons. Number one, they only look at the stock. They don't look at the flow, right? They don't look at how fast it's been ramping up. They only, you know, I mean, Japan has been letting in like substantial numbers of immigrants for much, uh, for a much shorter time than Europe has, right? And so it, it's just been a lot shorter. So they, they, people don't look at the ramp up. They just say, oh, well, it hasn't gotten to that high level yet. And in people's minds, 4% and 0.1% might as well be the same thing, even though that would be a 400, you know, 400 X increase, right? So like people don't understand that, that ramp up at all. And also people don't understand the, the fact about Japanese statistics that minorities are counted as Japanese if they were born in Japan. So, so Japan does not, people, th people equate the percent of foreign born people with the percent of, um, of minorities in Japan, but that's wrong. Uh, if I went to Japan and had kids with like a Russian woman or something, then that kid would be Japanese in the statistics. No qualifier, no hyphen, nothing. That kid is Japanese. And that's how France works too. Actually. So, um, yes. So anyway, that is why uh, people don't understand how much Japan is open to immigration, but people are starting to see it because people go to, I mean, Tokyo, like essentially all the immigrants go to Tokyo. It's, it's the New York of Japan, right? Tokyo is becoming a, a multiracial, multicultural city. Uh, and you know, and then, um, you just go into any like cafe and like, there's, there's white people working in a cafe. There's, you know, and another, by the way, there's one more reason people don't realize how non-homogeneous Japan is. People walk down the street, you know, Japanese people walk down the street and they're like, oh, Chinese person, Filipino person, you know, like whatever, right? Americans don't recognize the difference. Like, hmm, Asian person, how homogeneous. You know, but, but like, um, that's like if, if Japanese people couldn't tell the difference between like, you know, like, um, you know, white Americans and like, you know, Persian Americans and like Mexican Americans and all these things, they just couldn't tell the difference. Like, ah, oh, a bunch of white people. You know, that's, that's like us failing to recognize the difference between like Japanese, Chinese, and you know, like to Japanese people, that's a minority, right? And of course they count as foreign born in statistics, um, to, to Americans, you know, just a bunch of Asian, <laughs> like, and so we don't recognize the actual diversity visually when we go, I do, but most people don't because I, you know, and, um, I can, re I recognize the difference in clothes and, and slight differences in appearances and things like that. Um, ethnic diversity is important. It's been important in America for a long time. It's important in Japan. But people who want to hold on to this narrative of Japanese, you know, homogeneity don't recognize it. Uh, you know, they don't think about it or ignore it or just don't notice it, whatever, because like it doesn't suit, it doesn't fit their, their narrative. Um, that narrative is increasingly just broke. So, um, yeah, so Tokyo is becoming an international city. Yeah, you go in, go in restaurants and go in stores, there'll be like um, a bunch of people who visually just are obviously not ethnically Japanese or, or ethnically uh, Yamato, as they say. That's the, it, it, the, what we would you know, label the Japanese race is actually Yamato, yeah. um, which is also the name of a famous battleship. And which then became a space battleship in a cartoon. Hmm. Interesting. Segment, we were zooming out a bit beyond immigration. So you mentioned one of you know, the legacy of, of Shinzo is that he opened up immigration. T talk more about the le legacy of Shinzo Abe and, and you know, what he meant to Japan and what, what were the impacts and after effects. Right. He, Shinzo Abe did a couple big things. Um, he wanted to do so, so he directed the central bank. So in Japan, the central bank's less independent. Um, he basically picked Japanese central bankers who really wanted to do a lot of monetary easing. So they did very easy monetary policy. That's the legacy of that is one reason why the yen is so cheap today, uh, because they got sort of in this mindset of very easy monetary policy. Uh, in the nineties, they were more about hard money, but then Shinzo Abe came in. He's like, no, easy money, uh, guys. And just appointed those like Kuroda and, and other people. And then, um, so they, uh, uh, really printed a bunch of money that stimulated employment a lot. It didn't get them out of deflation until COVID came along and helped and gave them a push, but it stimulated the economy. And that meant that everyone basically went to work. He liberalized some working rules too, and then put some limits on overtime, which encouraged like hiring of more people instead of making the existing people work longer. Uh, when I lived in Japan in the mid 2000s, um, back, in, back in my day, when, uh, you know, in Japan, like there was this distinct pattern where 
women only work part time or not at all. Like, you know, a lot of married women wouldn't work. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of young women would live with their parents and just have a part time job that couldn't pay rent on their own, but can like support their lifestyle. Um, and then you had, uh, and then a lot of young people either didn't work or just work part time. And then old people didn't. And so you had, you know, prime age men and even, even, you know, old, some older men would work just like, like dog would work, you know, just like men, like 70 hour weeks. They were just at their desks all the time. They wouldn't take lunch. You know, I would go to lunch restaurants and I would be the only man in the restaurant. So then, um, yeah, one guy was like, Hey man, where do I, where do I meet girls in this country? I was like, lunch, <laughs> you know, you're the only man. It's no, no competition, but that's gone. I mean, that's, that's gone. Like, um, but, but the reason was because the men were just working, working, working. And they were expected to eat like lunch boxes at their, at their open plan office desks. Well, the women would just go out and eat lunch. You know, that was fine. That those days are done. Abe changed all of this. Abe um, and his and the people he appointed, but also just you know, so so the corporate the corporate governance code was changed. That was under Abe, and um, I uh, I uh, it was great. I went in to see the bureaucrats in their little like incredibly crappy offices that looked like the kindergarten that I went to in like you know <laughs> in the eighties. Like it it just was run down and crappy with these tiny plastic chairs, and they sat there with these like PowerPoints and they, which they printed out instead of showing me on a screen, they sat there, they showed me printouts of PowerPoints and they're like, ah, we're going to make them do this. And there was just these guys with crazy hair. That's who's working the Japanese bureaucracy. They're like, ah, ha, ha, guess what we're going to make these guys do. And, and they did it, you know? And, and so profitability went up. And so, um, corporate profitability went way up. Corporations made much better use of labor. Uh, women now work in Japan. So the idea of like women don't work is over. Women are more likely to have a job in Japan than in America, even at the height of our best job boom ever. So women all work in Japan now. Um, old people increasingly work. Young people increasingly work. The, the number of basically all these like people just like living with their parents and working just like a little bit of like takoyaki stand or whatever, that's kind of done, you know, like, um, and then I would, Unfortunately, it's, it's impacting the quality of a lot of like amateur art because there used to be a lot of young people with nothing to do who create amazing art because they had all this talent that was going nowhere. Now, less so because they all have jobs. So everyone in Japan works, 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 works. We always had the stereotype of Japan as a place where people work too much because we're all thinking of like prime age men, right? Where, who did? They worked a lot. Now everyone works like that. And so it's, it's become a, an overworked, gloomier country in that sense. Uh, less fun the urbanism is still extremely fun but a lot of the people having fun now are tourists and foreigners playing while the japanese people themselves work 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 not as fun as when i was there um but the country is still is still fun so now when you go and hang out with the fashion kids on the street that i, I love to photograph you know uh half of those kids are from brazil sweden belarus god knows where you know half of them or or i even met the the photographer for the u.s seventh fleet the navy there uh, she was extremely into like making her own clothes and dressing up in street fashion. And she would come hang out with the fashion kids on the weekend and show us photos that she took of like aircraft carriers and bombers and stuff. And it was, that was kind of crazy. Anyway, so Japanese culture is shifting. People work now too much in Japan uh, because the corporate culture still hasn't shifted to allow people to work more at home and have more flexible schedules. That hybrid work is, is necessary to get, give Japanese people back some of the social life that they've lost. So that's one, one reason to make that change, not just for productivity and efficiency's sake, but for the sake of also letting people not work themselves to death across every stratum of society. But Abe did that. Gender roles have changed such that women are expected to work. And, and Abe tried to get companies to promote more women. Those, there was some progress made, but it was much slower than he wanted. And that continues. Um, but because Japanese promotions are all seniority-based, it is obviously going to take decades to get the new hires promoted to the top. And, Japan does have much more uh, pay equality, by the way, than, than America at least used to. Uh, Japan has always had equal pay for equal work. Um, the downside of this is that it meant that they didn't evaluate anyone's work. Uh, but anyway, so uh, because that's how, they, that's how they did that. It wasn't anti-sexism. It was simply like, you know, lack of, uh, of merit. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so but, um, not the way they should have done it. But. Anyways, but, but now women work and they're slowly getting promoted. And so that's good. And then, um, and, uh, people are, are, um, the culture of like male work teams going out and, uh, and sort of 
having subsidized uh, uh, drinking sessions with hostesses who were like, you know, sort of escorts localized to a particular bar. Uh, that's going away. That's not. Um, I never liked that culture, so, you know, screw it. Uh, that was, it was pretty gross and stupid. Anyway, um, so hostess culture is kind of dying. Um, everybody works, more gender equality, a lot more immigration, corporates focus, corporations focus more on profitability, uh, and the tourism boom is the final thing that Abe changed his government encouraged tourism. They were like, let's get like, you know, like this many million tourists. And it was uh, the end of tourism boom ended up being four times what they expected. And now Japan is the place where everyone goes. And the weekend, of course, helped out a lot. Um, that easy monetary policy, everything's connected. Uh, so then, that's why the reason why we're going to plan a vacation in Japan is partly because Japan, you know, I would always go, right? But you are going to go now because all your friends have gone, yeah, exactly. right? And everyone sends these photos back from Japan. You want to see those things too, because yeah. it's just become this thing of going, Japan is the new place you go. So like, it's like in the past, you'd go to Venice, Paris. Like there were these tourist destinations, most of them in Europe. Now people realize that Japanese cities are incredibly nice. They're actually like arguably nicer than European cities now. And, um, and it, it, but in a different way, in a, in a modernized way, you know, European cities can often resemble like a museum of old Europe. Japanese cities are like a museum of 1990s Japan, in some way. But, but updated, you know, every, everything's really nice in Japan, except for the houses where people actually live are less nice. So um, Japan is like, crappy like crappy small house with crappy furniture and um and then like just amazing like public spaces and beautiful absolutely beautiful restaurants cafes parks shopping centers just gorgeous everything and then you go home and it's like you know your couch is like basically sitting on a boulder right and your <laughs> and your bed sucks and you can like barely get around your bed because it's so small and and so so uh, although although house sizes have increased a lot so i should i shouldn't say that um that is the old days. House, house sizes have, have increased, but still it's like, um, you know, the, the, the furniture quality is low in Japan. Uh, and, and things look, houses can look a bit dingy and, and run down. Um, whereas public spaces look amazing and beautiful. So, um, so that's sort of, that, that's cultural, actually. Like people need, you know, people want to, like, there's, yeah, more, more focus on like making public spaces look great. Yeah, well, that, uh, I want to be mindful of uh, of time. This has been a great tour of how uh, how Japan has evolved uh, economically and uh, and otherwise. And uh, we'll have to do a follow up episode, perhaps uh, when when we're there. Absolutely. Oh, that we could do a a, a, a recording from Japan. Yeah, that that would be epic. That would be so good. All right. Awesome. Until next time.